Welcome. Thanks for joining this session of Blue Team Village, Project Obsidian, Incident Response, and UDA Loop. My name is Julian, and I will be your guide for this walkthrough. It will focus on the UDA Loop and how to use it during security incident response, and illustrated by two alert cases of the same incident. This is part of a multiple walkthrough around incident response, but also forensic, threat intel, and various other aspects of cyber defense. We encourage you to attend other sessions, be it in real life or virtually. One of those is around triage and scoping, for which we will do a very quick reminder. Our agenda will be a quick introduction, the UDA loop, some key questions for incident response, or two alert case, a lesson learned and conclusion. For incident response, you will start with the triage and scoping. This is developed in a different session, but as a reminder, the six phase of a security incident are preparation, identification, containment, eradication, recovery, and lesson learned. And as a fundamental part, always keep in mind that you should document, document, and document what you are doing, be it for your colleague, be it for an auditor, be it for your management. This is necessary for any security incident response. Please note also this presentation and the corresponding notebook will be available after DEF CON. Let's move to the OODA loop. It's, the OODA loop has been developed by US Colonel John Boyd from US Air Force in the 60s following his experience of, uh, during the Korean War. It was initially for dogfight, but the concept is widely applicable, most notably for us to security incident. What does UDA mean? Observe, orient, decide, and act. It's a quick sequence of steps that during a dogfight helps you to assess the situation and evaluate where you are, what action you want to take, and take the action. And it's usually operated multiple times inside a dogfight to help you win against your attacker, ideally because you are operating this loop faster than the attacker. It's kind of similar to the Deming wheel in ISO standard, the famous plan, do, check, act, but more at the micro level versus the, the macro level of ISO standard. Obviously, all the observation, orientation, decision, will be based on the context of outside information, of cultural information and past experience, whatever has been analyzed during this event. Key question. During an incident, what is very important is identify what you know and what you don't know. To quote Don and Runcells, there are known knowns, there are known unknowns, and there are unknown knowns and unknown unknowns. The usual start is often, is it a false positive? Is it a known legitimate activity, a known testing, be it a pen testing or something else? Do we have enough visibility to assess the situation and at a sufficient confidence level? That's very essential to say we are not making confirmation bias and misevaluating things because we have just, for example, one source of information which would maybe not be reliable. We want to be sure that evidence can be preserved to be ensure that your colleague can do the same assessment or if things go to court that court can evaluate the same situation with the same information. We want to know obviously which user are impacted, which role and permissions they had, same thing for system. We want to know 
what stage of the attack it is and is it live active versus the attacker has left and you are only doing basically the cleaning or preventing the attacker to come back. How did it start? Who or what is the patient zero? Did lateral movement occur? Do we have just a single system impacted or are there many? Which data attacker has access with some legal impact? And last but not least, what is the business impact? Uh, were there service and availability, some information disclosure or in data tampering? Let's move to an early alert. As part of Project Obsidian, team has simulated different scenario and kill chain. Now we will see what happens is during an early level of this attack, we got a notification. In this case, user Brent Sorsium got an email notification that he logged in the company jam post, but he didn't. In a very good company member, he notified security. You are security, what are you doing? So identification phase. As said for the OODA loop, we will do some question. Each question will result in one or maybe multiple observation. Those observations will orient investigation and result in decision and action. One quick reminder as a start for any incident or alert, have a ticket where you will document things, acknowledge the alert to the user when it's a manual report and share the ticket reference. Depending on the context, you might or might not share more information. Document what's known, what's unknown, what's your understanding of the initial reporting of the alert. It's important to know that not all users are reporting things the same way. And one user can say, can share a lot of details when another will give you, my computer is crashing. And you, you will have to ask the question to say, yeah, okay, is it a security incident? And why, what int you to make a security report? Following this documentation and as part of avoiding any bias, you want to regularly have peer review. First iteration of the UDA loop. From an observation perspective, we look at the AD authentication log, which show a password spray attack has happened and multiple accounts were compromised. We can orient ourselves by reaching out to IT or help desk to validate there is no related activity, pen testing, testing, or similar that could be associated to this behavior. After we want to decide, do we want to move to the next phase or to more identification? Let's review how we can do this authentication. As part of our Jupyter Notebook, we are using Mystic Pi library to do a Splunk query. As an example, we collect successful and failed logon per user account and source IP. If we try to visualize this data, we have a nice chart on the AD authentication by user. And we can see this line which is nearly always associated with a password spread. So normally this graph is interactive inside um, the presentation mode. It does not render as well as we want, but uh, we can change things. Let's see a snapshot of the rendering where we have more of the user, but we can see that all the user of the company basically has an attempt to log in. 
on, on the chart, we don't see if it's failed or successful. But if we review another visualization per IP user versus IP, we can see that all those logins are coming from a single IP address, which for some reason I can't uh, change in the presentation. Sorry for that. With those information, it's easier to say from the log, I want to get all successful login from this identified attacker source IP, which from your security documentation and or your IT documentation, you can confirm if this source IP is related to your company or not. In this case, we can find that from a single IP, we have five different users that have login and it's a public IP. So it's likely that the attacker is using uh, this as an entry point. Just with authentication log, we know the attack vector is a password spread. We have the source IP of the attacker. Maybe there is a single one, maybe there is more. And we have identified there is not just one account compromise, but five. It's important here to have not jumped the gun compared to the re user report where if you had actions that directly, you would have only one user contain or disable and which would not have blocked the attacker because there were five access. On a few things we don't know, are those account privilege? Are there any other entry point? And what activity happen after that? For further iteration of the UDA loop, we can check if there are where password reset, if some MFA change happen, if some cloud app token change, we may want to collect more information, be it through a VM snapshot or more granular artifact collection like process activity, network activity, auto runs. Depending on your environment, we may want to add telemetry if it's missing, host agent, log collection, network collection like IDS, IPS. And depending on your assessment of the incident, notify management. In, depending on your company, that may happen earlier, that may happen later. Depends on your process. We won't dig further in this early alert case because we will review in the late alert case. Now moving to the containment. Containment should be proportional to the type of incident and the business impact. You are unlikely to stop a, a, a service that brings millions of revenue if you have a small phishing from a, a Nigerian president. And if, you are, if the attacker is exfiltrating your customer data or your company intellectual property, it's very likely that action should be taken immediately. Those questions should be asked in your to your leadership early on and ideally in preparation phase, not during the incident. First typical action for containment, lock, disable the affected user account. We may reevaluate, is it enough? If it's not enough, we can decide to contain or isolate compromised system or suspicious one. If email propagation is used, we may want to freeze the mail server queue or recall or delete some email. That's only a few of the actions that may happen or may be needed during an incident. Following containment, we are doing eradication. Normally, we always want to rebuild compromised asset because from a security analyst perspective, that's the only way to ensure that an asset is clean. Sometimes business will decide otherwise because the asset is a legacy, it can't be rebuilt or it will take too much time. Ultimately, that's an executive choice decision to balance between the risk. 
after any rebuild, you should ensure that the system is functional and protected. Depending on the assessment, we ensure that patch or configuration has been fixed to ensure it can't be attacked. And we obviously want to be sure that the business service is operational. For recovery, we declare return to normal service, validate again that service are functional, normal monitoring is functional, no abnormal behavior observed for some grace period, um, ensure attacker is not coming back. Let's move to the late alert. We are more at the end stage of the attack. The previous alert has not happened, or maybe was missed or misclassified. We have an automated security alert raised on the company jump post titled Mimikatz Execution Detection. What are you doing? Let's do a quick reminder of what is Mimikatz. It's a very popular security tools that allow to extract plain text password, hash, and various secrets from memory. And it can perform various type of attack, including pass the hash, pass the ticket. And it's very often used by attacker as an open source tool. We start again from identification. We talk about IT staff or business staff. It's very important that you have a good documentation, be it inventory, identity matrix, network matrix, that will help you a lot, but clearly it ne will never replace helpful staff. You still want to have documentations that will most often make your work easier and faster versus trying to wake up the engineering on call or wait somebody on a bridge. First iteration of the OODA loop, again, we try to validate is it a pen test or a legitimate activity um, by IT or by some non-user. Uh, depending on your company, you may have user more normal or more abnormal than others and doing some activity which may resemble an attacker. It's part of the knowledge and the baselines that you build over time in preparation of incident. Next, we confirm that the Mimikatz execution is not legitimate. We want to know which credentials were stolen and are they reusable as is? Typically, is it end user accounts, service accounts, some cloud accounts? If it's local credential versus domain credential, are they domain admin or are they um, standard user? Um, are there some group policy object restriction in place, typically to prevent the use of a domain admin outside of certain system? Are you using LAPS, which is a Microsoft tool to ensure that only uh, each local administrator password will be unique and this way they can't be reused to attack another system? We want to know what attacker action occurred and whether data exfiltration active or not. Let's coming back to our notebook and to a Splunk query. We try to check the process activity. Here, two example query with either event ID 4688, net, net, native process command line auditing in Windows, or with Sysmon event ID one, which is an extra tool, but often recommended by security people. From a visualization, perspective when we build the process tree of the jump post. We can see various activity attached to one of the user, which is named Pat Resus. 
sorry. And you can see that there is a cascade of activity that's mostly related to power shell, but we will see other activity more on this screenshot where you can see some task list call, some run DLL32 with the mini dump argument, some who am I command. What we know from this process tree, we can say reconnaissance activity has happened. We, we have some who am I task list, possibly other command. We have a process memory dump, which is unlikely to be any time legitimate. The who am I of task list, maybe your sysadmin can be responsible for it, but doing a process memory dump, very unlikely. And we know that lateral movement occurred. The, the cascading of PowerShell and CSC with a computer list argument is a result of poor exploit invoke port scan. The CSC is because PowerShell is calling a commandlet which is using C sharp. And as such, each call is resulting in a CSC children process that will do this um, live compilation of the blog. One thing that we don't know or we don't see in this process tree was Mimikatz or some PS exec that you, you can be in in the foreign sync workshop. There are there can be various reasons, but one thing obviously is the data can have been tempered by the attacker or inadvertently. It can be a wrong filter by the analyst. It can be a software bug or configuration is issue. That's one reason you want to have multiple data source and validate they all goes into the same direction. If we review another log, we have identified that the activity is occurring on the RDP jump post. Zeek was deployed in this environment. We can try to filter some of the activity either by some top DNS uh, list, top 1 million, top uh, 10,000, and say, what are the domain left? From some filtering action, we can identify those domains, interactsh.com, file pizza, financial, magnum tempus financial.com, webwormhole.io, transfer.sh. What we know, likely the attacker has done an exfiltration or maybe is on uh, doing it currently, depending on, on your timeline. The only case, and that's where it's important to know your company context, is maybe there is a legitimate, legitimate business use case, but usually it will be for one service. Seeing four different services is less likely to be legitimate. We also have seen some typo requests on company domain, Magnum Tempus Financial which suggests that the attacker was doing a manual execution. Sometimes it can be also a way to mislead the analyst by the attacker, but at least as a first appreciation, that seems the attacker was doing things manually, not an automated, or at least not a fully automated attack. You can review the forensic station walkthrough for more. On containment, depending on the pace of your investigation, you may stop the attacker before during data exfiltration, before data destruction and log wiping. Again, we may want to lock or disable affected user account. We may also want to restrict network access, be it by domain IP address to block common control or to prevent exfiltration of data. 
that will depend a lot of what are the options available in your company. If, for example, you have a proxy or only uh, an IDS. If you are arriving very late during the incident and you already observe that we are in a stage where the attacker is doing event log clearing on many servers, including domain controller, which means that they basically own most of your network. It's time, if not already, to escalate to crisis team. This will in usually include someone from ex each executive branch, legal, communication, HR, potentially more. If you have not already done so, but hopefully it is done, inform the management. We may want to unplug from the network or shut down impact system. Unplugging from network is usually preferred as it will help to preserve evidence, most notably in memory, but it will depend a lot again on your context and what can you do, especially in a re remote setup. In worst case, more global sh network shutdown, typically at office or data center level, maybe something needed. You want to switch to out-of-band communication. Usually, if an attacker has control on your domain controllers, that means they also have control on your exchange or mail system, your chat system, likely. You want to involve external partner, your insurance, your external returner, which may be required or recommended by your insurance law enforcement, information sharing and analysis center, KISAC, and national or sector CERT. Those last two are very important because they help structure your sh the sharing of information and eventually share things in a way which are not uh, liable for you and share this information in a way which is not necessarily identifiable. It's important that you can help that if other company have made similar threats, you can get more input to react faster, um, typically to, to do the containment or to um, know that this threat actor is respecting uh, their engagement when you pay them or they are not respecting those. You want to validate your backup. Normally that's an early recovery step, but especially in ransomware case, it can influence contentment, meaning results should be known early. Early, if your attacker has destroyed your backup or if your backup are corrupt or have never been tested, you probably have no backup. And as a result, you probably want to make more care on protecting system, preserving evidence, keep a copy of encrypted data. If maybe a decryptor is found, maybe in a month, maybe in a year, whatever. Ultimately, a very hard decision in a ransomware case is, do you want or not pair ransomware? That's a very trolley problem or Cornelian dilemma that you should think carefully and discuss with relevant parties. There is no right answer from a security or law enforcement perspective. The recommendation will be always not pay. But obviously, if your company's life is at stake, that's a harder call, especially if you are at risk to finance terrorism or uh, cyber criminal. You also want to monitor internet, uh, the different various media and forum to ensure that your incident is not leaked too early and that you have time to prepare communication. Eradication phase. We want, like previously, rebuild assets, but in ransomware case, you have probably 
uh, very high number of system impacted. And first you need, if you have not already prepared it, establish a priority for service recovery. What should be repaired first? Is it your business system, your payroll system, your active directory, whatever else? Ideally, that's come from your disaster recovery plan or business continuity plan, and it's done before any incident. But if it's not the case, that's your first step. After rebuilding assets. Next, like in the pre uh, previous case, we want to validate system are functional and protected. We don't want the attacker to come back. Recovery, stem than previously. Return to normal service, validate. Finally, the lesson learned. You should have a final communication to close an incident. And it should either include or be followed by the incident report. You should include executive summary, key findings with recommendation, what went good, what can be improved, a high level timeline. Depending on your organization, alignment with MITRE ATT&CK, MITRE SHIELD, NIST SP-853 or ISO 27 may be good addition. And part of all recommendations should feed your org risk register and be visible to decision maker and executive. You don't want to let an incident and use each incident is an opportunity for improvement. If you are not using it, you leave the door open to an attacker. It could be the same one, or it could be another one. More will be developed in the final reporting walkthrough. As a conclusion, security incident response is very often a marathon. You need to take care of your team and yourself, plan for overload, plan for helper, be it internal or external. Preparation is key. Establishing process, trust, and collaboration take time. Train early, train like you fight, and fight like you train. Reevaluate situation often during an incident. If you have better situational awareness than the attacker, the better. Know yourself, know your enemy, and you can fight a hundred battle without disaster. OODA loop is one method to structure this. Last, make it easier for you and your team. Structure and automate the work so decision can be taken better and faster. Jupyter Notebook is one way to structure, to automate things, and it helps to document and show the reasoning of investigation and avoid bias. This is the end of this walkthrough. Thanks a lot for attending it. I also want to thank all the contributors to Blob Team Village Project Obsidian and to Project Jupyter Notebook, Panda, Mystic Pi, Open Threat Research. Enjoy Blue Team Village and DEF CON, be it virtually or in real life. Thanks to you and join the conversation on our Discord.